Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church on this beautiful Lord's Day. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. And this is Preach Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to everyone. Remember you can get the singing, the music, and the message on cassette tape number 321 right into my post office box, 501 Athens, Georgia, 30603. We send them out for a gift of $3, and the gift is used to help take care of our radio expense. I want you to turn, would you please, to Ephesians chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I have two announcements to make. The Lord willing, tomorrow night I'll be speaking in the South Carolina Independent Baptist Fellowship in Greenville, South Carolina. There'll be quite a few preachers there and others, so you pray for us. And then next Saturday night, there's going to be a special singing in the uh, schoolhouse over in uh, Danielsville High School Gym, rather. It'll be in the high school gym, Madison County High School Gym, next Saturday night, beginning at 7 o'clock. Now, this singing is a benefit singing for a great and worthy cause. And the Melody Airs Quartet from Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, will be featured there. And then the Blessed Hope Singers, the Northside Baptist Church, will be singing. The others, no doubt, from the church here, and maybe other singers, will be singing. That's next Saturday night at 7 o'clock in the high school gym in uh, Danielsville in Madison County. So you attend if you enjoy good singing. Many of you listen to our singers here at Northside, and you don't get a chance to maybe hear them in person. They'll give you an opportunity to hear them in person. And so you go and get in on it and tell your friends and neighbors about it. Get the word around and I know that you'll enjoy the blessings of the singing there next Saturday night. It'll be on the direction of my associate, Brother Tony Crawford. He'll uh, be in charge of it and he'll have it set up and, and organized well, I'm sure, to be a blessing to everyone that can come and get in on the singing, which is a good and worthy cause. Turn to... Um, Ephesians chapter 5, two weeks ago I brought a message entitled Termites in the Home. I've had, heard quite a few comments on that message. Then last Sunday I followed that up with uh, the marriage vow among young people or the marriage vow period. And so I've had quite a few people to comment on that message. We're going to continue on today with a series on the home. There'll be at least five, counting the one on the termites in the home, which is 319. One last Sunday is 320. One today will be number 321. And I want you to turn to Ephesians 5. As I said last Sunday, there'll be some people that won't uh, appreciate the, this type of preaching. They, in fact, there'll be some might be even angry at the preacher. But you better be careful about that because if I'm giving you the word of God, then your problem is with the Word of God, not with the preacher. I didn't write the Bible, I just preach it. God wrote the Bible, God called me to preach, and so that's what I preach, that's what He called me to preach. And whether you agree with me or not, then that's up to you. I don't preach to please people, never have. I've been preaching almost 46 years, and I'm not going to start preaching to please people now, I never have and never will. And as long as God gives me breath, I'm going to preach the word of God, my conviction, and preach to people uh, like they are and where they are, and cut the tree and let the chips fall where they may. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 18, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And in verses to follow, you're going to find the Spirit-filled home. How God tells you to have a spirit-filled home. Now look at verse 19. Speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, 
Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Nothing dishonorable to submit yourself to your own husband. He's yours. And so why not abide according to what God said? He belongs to you anyway. And so a lot of women get the idea, I'm not going to submit to my husband or any man. Well, God said you submit to your own husband. If he's yours, if he's not worth having, what did you marry him for in the first place? And then it says, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husband, love your wives, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nursed and cherished it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I'll be dwelling primarily on that verse today, verse 31. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let everyone particularly so love his wife, even as himself. The wife see that she reverence her husband. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, last Sunday morning, we talked about the marriage vow. Someone said a good wife is God's last gift to a man from heaven. The Bible tells us if you receive a good wife, then of course you receive something precious. And if you have a good wife, you ought to thank God for your good companion. And we talked about the marriage vow last Sunday morning. You need to know the person you marry quite well. You need to pray about it as a Christian. And then Christians that are married, Christians only. And then we left off by telling you there's some today that's already fouled up, divorced, remarried, maybe divorced, remarried again, and so forth and so on. And you say, preach, Edward, what must I do? Well, do the best you can. Now, you've already maybe made mistakes in the past, and it wouldn't be good to make another mistake by saying, well, I'm going to divorce the person I have now because I think it's wrong. Well, if you made a mistake, you're going to have to ask God to forgive you and try to make the best of it. It might be a scar upon your testimony, but that's something you'll have to face God about in the day of judgment. Now, there is, we know, uh, grounds for marriage and divorce in the Bible, and I won't go into that, um, grounds for divorce in the, in the Bible. And I think if you got a divorce on the biblical grounds, you'd certainly have a right to marry the person, the right person, that you might uh, be felt there to do so if that takes place. A lot of preachers don't agree with that, but that's my viewpoint. There's a man one time that he's no bachelor, and somebody asked him, said, why don't you get married? He said, I'd rather go through life wanting something I never had than to go through life having something I never wanted. And you need to think that through. Now, be very much concerned about your lifelong companion. As I said last Sunday, as a Christian, I believe, young people, if you are mean business with God and ask God to direct you, God will lead you to that right person. But if you run ahead of God and think, well, this is my first chance to get married, I better grab it, you might make a bad mistake and be sorry later. Be sure you're in the will of God. Now we're going to talk about now what young people ought to do whenever they get married. A lot of people say, well, I'll just go ahead and get married and love my wife, love my husband, live in lust and so forth and never think about any responsibility or obligation. That's dead wrong. When you decide to take a woman for your wife or a man for your husband, there's a great responsibility that goes along with that. Now, as I said last Sunday, you don't have to wait until you're dead with old age to get married. And uh, you can marry too young. The Bible said, Rejoice with the wife of thy youth. That means 
Marry fairly young. Wait until you're grown and settled and settle down. They say it's a proven fact if a man waits until he's 28 years old to get married, he had never married the person he would marry at the age of 17. He'd be a different person. Well, there might be something uh, to that because you've got about 11 years there difference in, in the time element and your mind might change or her mind might change during that time. And uh, so there's, there's a change in a man's life and attitude and, and uh, what he desires and does desire in the way of a companion many times. Now the Bible tells us here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now when you get married, when God joins you together, you become one. Now a lot of this marriage today is not of God. People run into the courthouse, get a marriage license, take a blood test, run, get somebody to marry them and they marry maybe in the in regard and respect to the law of the land, and God has nothing to do with it. A lot of it. God has nothing to do with it. Don't blame it on God. But when God joins a couple together, they become one. A lot of people marry just for lust. They say, well, I'll get married. If it doesn't work out well, I'll divorce and marry somebody else. That's not true marriage. That's not from heaven. That's not of God. When you're thinking about a holy matrimony, it should be a matter of prayer, consideration, and then, of course, uh, be sure that you're willing to live with that person the rest of your days. Be willing to take that person as a lifelong companion. And remember, you become as one, the Bible tells you. There's no person to come between you and your husband or your wife, not even your children. Your husband comes first. Your wife comes first and then comes the children. If you have the idea that your children come first and then your wife, then you, you're not moving according to Scripture. You're not thinking right. Because you and your wife becomes one. And together the children are from you. And then together you love and protect and guide those children. But they come number one in your life. You must remember that. Then the children come along secondly. And you must keep that in mind. And because you are one, I told you about the preacher that said, No child, none of my children, not even would be my grandchildren, my parents, or anybody, would even sit between me and my wife at the dinner table or ride between me and my wife in my automobile. Said my wife is sitting next to me at the table. My children know that. They don't sit between us. When we get in the automobile, my children don't sit between me and my wife. She's next to me. And he said, that's the way it should be. Your wife is number one. Your husband is number one. And you need to realize that if you're not willing to make that person number one, you better remain unmarried according to the word of God. And when you get married, the Bible said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother because they're one. That is when he marries you young lady, he's not marrying your mother and daddy. Young girl, listen to me. When you marry that man, you're not marrying his mom and daddy. You're marrying him. A lot of parents get the idea that when their children marry, that they marry them. No, no. When your children get married, you step out of the picture. That doesn't mean that they're to be disrespectful toward you. They need, if you need their help in time of sickness or whatnot, and uh, children will be, be concerned about their parents and be willing to help their parents. But Parents should not come between a man and his wife. Meddling in-laws has caused a lot of trouble in many homes. When you get married, mother and dad steps out of the picture and you and your wife becomes one. That's one good thing about these mobile homes. Because that provides a means whereby when a young couple gets married, they don't have to try to save up money to buy a funny tour. It's already supplied. With funny too many of them, you just go get a mobile home, set the thing up, and start business, start housekeeping. And that's where it should be. I, I like that about those mobile homes. Because it lets a lot of young couples, as soon as they get married, to get out on their own. Now, there used to be a time back when I was a little boy, my grandfather had a big farm and several children and about a seven-room house. 
And when one of my dad's brothers married, then they could bring their wife in, take over one of the rooms, and help work the crop on the fall of the year and gather the crop, and then find them a place to move. And they got along all right because they had about a seven-room house and a lot of land to farm. Made it pretty well, but that's changed today. There's no house big enough today for two or three families. You mark that down. Just as certain as you try to put two or three families in one house, you're going to have trouble. You'll get along all right maybe for a short period of time, but she's coming. You're going to have trouble. You'll have to live on your knees. And in this book, if you make it today in a house with two or three families, because people are too nervous, they're too fractious, we're living in a fast age, and things doesn't work today like it used to when people had plenty of time to do what they wanted to do in. And everybody today is running by the clock and by the second and you get too nervous and fractious and ill toward each other and it just don't work. Now the Bible said when you get married, young couple, as quick as you possibly can, you get out on your own and start your own family and mind your own business. Don't look to your parents to have to keep you up or buy your groceries or pay your rent or whatnot. Get on your own, get your job. In fact, it means you ought to have a job before you get married. A young man that'll marry a beautiful young girl and take out of a good home where she has a good living, and he doesn't have a job, well, I'd, I'd be very careful about marrying that man right quick like. I would want him to find him a job and be able to work and provide for me before I'd marry him. I wouldn't marry a loafer. What do you want with a loafer to loaf around a pool room, a gambling hall, a beer dive, drink beer and shoot pool and, and rip around while you're trying to work and keep him up? That's not right. We'll say more about that later. But you got to get out on your own if you want to make a go of it. Now there may be an exception. There may be a very few homes where they get along pretty well. But sooner or later something is, may happen there that'll cause trouble. And there's mother-in-laws and son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws and father-in-laws today that won't even visit one another. Won't even speak to each other because they stayed together in the house too long. The daughter and the mother-in-law got into fuss. The father and the son-in-law got into fuss and whatnot, and they're mad at each other today. You think that's right? No, that's wrong. And if you got out on your own, start your own home, run your own business, then it'd been different. And if you can't do that, young man, you better remain unmarried because you're headed for trouble as certain as the world. Too many meddling in-laws. I don't know what it's last Sunday or Sunday before I told you about this uh, mother that so close to her daughter, when she found out her daughter's engaged to get married, she said to her, I want to go with you on your honeymoon. Daughter said, Mama, you can't do that. You can't go with us on our honeymoon. Oh, yes. Yes, I can. And she's a tight woman, and when the boyfriend would leave, her mother would come in and say, What did he say to you? What did he tell you? What did y'all talk about tonight? And so um, you have a lot of nosy women like that, you know. And they want to find out everything that the boy said to their daughter while he was visiting where they'd been and so forth and so on. But anyway, she said, uh, my fiancé won't give in to that. But she told him, but he said, you know, he said, that's, that's silly. He said, we don't want her dragging along with us on our honeymoon. And, but mother kept on insisting. And finally, the boy gave over. He said, all right, bring her along. So they got married and they took off and went to a motel and there they checked in and there's a zoo out nearby and they had a little time there before night and they began to walk around and want to look at the animals and mother she is right there about a, a few feet out in front you know leading the way and they're walking along and a big old lion saw him man he didn't like the looks of her at all that mother-in-law and so he broke out of that cage and jumped on that woman and she began to scream, and her daughter said to her, her new husband, said, uh, said, do something. He said, look at that. He said, do something. Look what's happening. He said, that lion is, is going to kill my mother. You know what he said? He said, that lion got himself in that mess. Let him get out of the best way he can. So we need to realize that meddling in-laws many times can cause heartaches and troubles and disappointment, and it's just absolutely not right. So we need to realize that you need to get out on your own. I know many of you, I'm sure, have heard this by some of these uh, singers and and uh, people that uh, you know like to tell their tales and jokes and so forth. 
uh, telling about the mother-in-law that the mule kicked. This mother-in-law is always nosing into their problems and kept him irritated and worried all the time, kept a fuss in the house. He had an old mean mule to just kick the fire out of her, and uh, they put him in the hospital. And the next day, he went up to the hospital to take his wife to check on his mother-in-law, and there's a great group of men gathered around that hospital down near her room. Oh, he said, uh, uh, somebody said, I, I didn't know your mother-in-law had all these friends. He said, why? Well, said, they didn't come up here to see her. said, they're all up here to try to buy that mule that kicked her. And so sometimes a mule might come in handy in a case like that, but you don't always have a mule, you know. And so get out on your own, start your own business. If you don't do that, you're headed for trouble, and always plan and arrange for that before you marry someone. You men, you young boys that's listening today, uh, you need to make plans for your wedding and be sure you have a job and be sure you can provide for your wife and be sure that you can establish your home in the right manner and be responsible for your home. We'll say more about that when we get to that part of the series, but get out on your own. That's, that's the thing I want to drive home today. Don't live in the house with your mother and daddy or her mother and daddy until there's trouble and they kick you out. Don't do that. Get out immediately. Oh, you say, now, Preacher Edwards, they just insist that we come on and live with them. They have plenty of funny tour and, and uh, nobody else in the home but mother and daddy. And they just insist that we come on in and, and live with them until maybe we can get on our feet. Yes, you have to get on your feet more times than one if you stay there too long. You need to realize you're headed for trouble as certain as the world. Don't do that. Just say, I thank you. It's very nice of you. I appreciate you making that offer. But I think it's better that we get us a place and start our own home. And that's exactly what you ought to do. Now, you young people listen to this Baptist preacher today. Let me have your ears. Keep your feet on the floor and look at the preacher. If you are not willing to do that, you've got no business getting married. You're headed for trouble. The Bible plainly said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Didn't say move in with them. The Bible says, Leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, and that you ought to do. Now you keep that in mind. Now let's move on to another thought. And that is the man is to assume his place of responsibility in the home. Now the word husband means uh, the band of the house. Now let that sink in. The word husband means the band of the house. He's the band that's to hold the home together. Now if you're not willing to be the band of the house, you got no business getting married. There's certain responsibility that goes along with marriage. And that man is to realize that and he's to realize he's responsible for his home. God's going to hold him responsible. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, I didn't write that. I just told you what God said in the Bible. He said the husband is the head of the wife. God wrote this book, not me. Now, this year, women's lib movement today, or lip movement, or whatever you want to call it, is out of the pit. It's not of God. A woman can never be on equal grounds with man. She'll either be above man in respect or fall below man. Now, you better remember that. And I'm not a male chauvinist today. I'm telling you what this Bible teaches. We respect womanhood in America, and we'll fight for our women, and we'll die for our women if need be. And we set them on high and respect them. But, beloved, that woman should demand that respect in her life and the way she lives and be in subjection to her husband. That's what God said in the book. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? For I know him. He will command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Now, God didn't say, I'm going to ask Abraham to consult Sarah and see if it's all right to do right. No place in the Bible can you find where God said for the man to ask his wife, is it right to do right? You ought to know what is right and do what is right, regardless of what people think about it. In the book of Joshua, chapter four, 24, verse 15, 
Joshua said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now Joshua didn't say, now let me go home, and I'm going to talk with Mrs. Joshua, and if it's all right with her, then we'll serve God. He didn't say that. Joshua said, for me and my house, we're going to serve God. And every man ought to take that attitude. You don't have to ask your wife if you can serve God. You don't have to ask your wife if you can do right. You know what's right and you know what you ought to do. And you should say to your wife and your family, we are going to serve God. Oh, you say, now preach Edwards. Uh, my wife is mean and, and she's as cruel as, as, um, uh, as Antipathy, the wife of Socrates, and she fusses and quarrels and nags and so forth. And I want to serve God and, and I just can't, uh, I just can't get her to do right. If you're a man of God, if you're saved, and you got the Holy Spirit in you, and you want to do right, you do right, and you turn that woman over to God, and if she don't line up, sooner or later God will line her up. God may stretch her out and put her in a box, but God Almighty will line her up if you mean business. I mean if you mean business. You can't compromise and play around about the thing. God may have to straighten you out. But if you're straight, you're right, you're honest, you mean business with God, and your wife is contrary and mean as the devil, then God will take care of her in due time. Old John Wesley used to have a wife as mean as the devil. Uh, he, every time he'd go up and down the road, many times he'd have to go out in the street, in the road, to read his Bible. His wife fussed and quarreled and nagged so much. And then as he'd go by the window, she'd stick her head out the window and start cussing him. God soon straightened that good lady out. Now, God can straighten them out. He sure can. And I contend that if a good Christian woman loves God, and she means business with God, it may take time and patience, but if she means business with God, God can do something about that mean, ungodly husband. I received a letter last week. My woman said, Preach Edwards, my home is about to go on the rocks. We have children. Me and my husband, uh, he just won't do right. He drinks. He cares on. I can't hardly live with him. Preach, I'm a nervous wreck. Please write and tell me what to do. I had to write that, dear woman, and advise the best I knew how. I believe if she'll be patient, long-suffering, and read 1 Peter chapter 3 and abide by the, the first half of that chapter, wait on God that God will straighten him out one way or the other. Now, God is able to do that. I believe it may take a little time. But God is able to straighten them out. I received a letter last week from a man in prison. He said, Preacher Edwards, I'm in prison. And I need your prayers. And I need the prayers of my family. And he said, I listen to your program every day if I possibly can. It means so much to me. There's a man. It's too late now. He's in prison. But he's concerned about his family. But I believe if that man ever gets out of prison, he'll be a different man. And have a different home. I believe that. He says now he loves God and knows the Lord. And so that man is to take the responsibility of that home. And say for me and my house we're going to serve God. Now when Eve sinned in the garden. What did God do about that? God came in the garden in the cool of the day. And did God say Mrs. Eve. Mrs. Eve I want to have a little talk with you. No no. When God came in that garden in the cool of the day. God said Adam. Adam, yes, Lord, I want to talk with you, Adam. Now, why did God call Adam? Eve is the first one to sin there. God called Adam because he was the head of his house, and he was the man, and he should do right, and he should take care of his wife in that respect and tell her right from wrong. And there God called Adam in and said, I want to have a talk with you, Adam. Now, God is going to hold you men responsible but what goes on in your house? You may have to have a war once in a while. You may reason with your family uh, so loud until they can hear your reasoning a mile or two away. But God holds the man responsible for his house. You may have a holy war every day, but God still holds you responsible for your house. And you're going to have to ask God to come in and help you straighten it out. I don't mean that you'll have a perfect home. I don't care how hard you try, how holy you are, how dedicated you are. You're going to have some problems along the way. You'll have some problems going out with your children, or maybe with your companion. And that's going to happen in spite of all you can do. But you must remember, 
God is looking down the gun barrel at you. You men I'm talking about. When God looks down the gun barrel, he sees you men at the end of that gun barrel. God is holding you men responsible. Now God held Adam responsible. The man is head of his house. If something goes wrong in your home and is sinful and wicked, God's not going to hold your wife responsible necessarily. She'll probably have to answer for some of her sins. But God is going to hold you responsible for that house. If there's cussing, if there's liquor drinking, if there's gambling, if you're stacking your refrigerator full of beer, wine, and liquor, if you allow things going in your house that shouldn't be there, you think God's going to come in and hold your children responsible? No, sir. Do you think God's going to hold your wife responsible? Not necessarily. Made a certain sin, but God's going to hold you men responsible. Whatever goes on in your house, you are responsible for it. Oh, you say, preacher, you don't know. I, I, I married a wild cat. I married a tiger. Well, you ought to have more sense to marry somebody like that. But since you married them anyway, you're just going to have to have a fight every day. I, I mean a holy war. you got to say, we're going to serve God around this place here. And I mean we're going to serve God. And if it gets to a place where you can't handle it, get on your knees, say, God, I need you to help me handle this situation. And God can take over and help you handle that situation in your home. You need to realize that. There's a man one time that he didn't believe there's any man the head of his house. Oh, he said, I don't believe there's a man in this community ahead of his house. Somebody say, oh, you'll find a few. He said, I know what I'm going to do. I got a load of chickens out here and I got some horses. And I'm going to every house in this community. And he said, every home where I find the man is ahead of his house, I'm going to leave a horse. I'm going to give him a horse. But said, where I find that, that the woman's ahead of the house, I'm going to leave a chicken. So he started out. He'd given away all his horses but two, give, give away quite a few of his chickens. Came to this house, and the man standing in the yard, he pulled up, told him what his mission was. And he said, I'm trying to find out who's the head of this house around here. And the old man said, you're looking at him right now. I said, I'm the head of this house. I said, that's fine. He said, where I find the man the head of the house, I'll leave a horse. Where I find the woman is the head of the house, the man's hen peck, I'll leave a chicken. He said, well, you're looking at the head of this house right now. He said, well, I'll leave a horse. I got two. I got a black one and a white one. He said, which one you want? Oh, he said, I think I'll take that uh, black boy there. About that time, his wife stuck her head out the window and said, no, we'll take the white boy there. Uh, he said to the man, said, I've changed my mind. said, I think I'll take the, the white boy. He said, oh, bless God, you won't. You get a chicken like the rest of these henpecked men around here. So he gave him a chicken. Now you need to realize that God knows whether or not you're the head of your house. We don't fool God. Man said to the fellow, said, to you, who's the head of your house around here? He said, I am. said, who told you? said, my wife. My wife said, I'm the head of this house. Well, you need to realize that God wants men to be the head of their home. And God's going to hold men responsible for being the head of that house, and you can't get by with it. Oh, you may say, now, preach, Edwards, I married a little spin-legged fellow, got a potato vine for a backbone, doesn't have sense enough to get in out of the rain. What must I do about do the best you can? You married the stupid thing. You have to get along the best way you can. Just ask God to help you. And God can help you. You should know better than marry a, a fork and stick with a pair of pants on. You ought to marry a man. When you women get ready to get married, be sure you marry a man and some little squirt coming along that doesn't know how to get in out of the rain. If you marry somebody that doesn't know how to get in out of the rain, then you're going to be rained on many times during your lifetime. So marry a man when you get married. Be sure he's a man. If you don't have sense enough to know a man from a little sissy, then you stay a uh, single because you don't tell him what you're liable to marry. But marry a man when you get married. And God's going to hold you men the head of your homes. Some of you fellas out there in the radio listening to us right now, you're mad as the devil about this thing, but you know you're guilty. You ought to be henpecked. You ought to straighten out, have your family in church next Sunday, and try to do right. Amen? You ought to do that. And so God expecting uh, young couples get out on their own, start their own homes, and that man realize he's the head of that house, and God is holding him responsible for that house. You can't get away from that. You can't deviate around it. God is holding that man responsible. God says, young people, get out on your own. Leave your father and mother. Get out on your own when you get married. If you can't do that, if you're tied to your mama's apron string, don't get married. If you can't run your own business, don't get married. But if you can, you might be a good prospect for a marriage. God help you. Let's stand our feet. Father in heaven, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. 
Lord God, so many homes went on the rocks. So many homes they operate in contrary to the word of God. And I pray, dear Father, that you use the message to stir hearts, stir souls. Help us to set our homes straight, our Father, according to the word of God. We need some great homes today, great men and great women. And I pray that you'll help us, our Father. Lord God, I pray that you'll have you in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Debbie plays a number for us. Says, Debbie, please listen to me. If you're here today and you're not right with God, or you're here today and you want to come back to God if you're backslidden, you want to join the church, or God impress upon you to move forward for any reason, would you come while we wait? I'll be waiting for you right here. Would you come? How about it? <laughs>